Record. All right, welcome everyone to um, adult Bible class at uh, Cavi Church. So am I, let's see, am I sharing? Oh yeah, I'm sharing my screen now, so that's good. And we're on week five of the tribulation. So what will happen in the tribulation? Part five. Today, it's going to be a quick review, and then we'll get jump back into going through various characters that we find in the, in the tribulational period. So the definition of the tribulation is that it's a future. That's a key word because some churches teach it's already past. Many, many do. But the tribulation is a future seven-year period during which God will give one final warning to unbelieving humanity. It will be an unprecedented time of suffering. It is uh, preceded by the church age and rapture and will conclude with Jesus' second coming, the confinement of Satan, and the beginning of the millennium. Let's see, I thought I had great tribulation, but you know that the, who, who can tell me what the great tribulation is? The last three and a half. So the second half of the seven years is called the Great Tribulation. Some people say the Great Tribulation is the whole thing. Could be, maybe, but that's good to avoid some people claim we live yeah. in it right now. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, some people do claim, but it is future, it's not present. Um, in the first half, this is a summary by Arnold Fruchtenbaum. So in the first half, um, there is there is debate, legitimate debate about some of the details, but basically, I think Arnold Fruchtenbaum is on the right track when he when he says that, or when he teaches that in the first half, the first three and a half years, you have seven seals and seven trumpets. You read about those in the first half of Revelation. And so, uh, yeah, during that time, there's a lot happening on earth, a lot of judgments, but there's also the two witnesses. Uh, there's the 144,000 Jews um, preaching the gospel. Um, the during this time, Israel is in a uh, agreement or a, an, an alliance with this world leader who will later turn against them at the three and a half year mark. So at the middle of the tribulation, so that's a that's a key moment because a lot happens here. The um, the Antichrist is, uh, is killed and then resuscitated. Um, the false prophet arrives, the treaty with Israel is broken, and the abomination of desolation discussed by di both Daniel and Jesus is set up in the temple in Jerusalem. And the Antichrist turns against Israel and tries to wipe them out. So that happens at the midpoint of the tribulation. And um, Sophie, did you hang up those things? Thank you. Um, in the second half of the tribulation, you have the seven bowl judgments and the gathering of armies for the Armageddon campaign. And at the end of that period, that's when Jesus returns, deals with the armies allied against Israel, um, uh, sentences the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire, chains Satan, and begins the 1,000-year messianic rule on earth that's predicted by the prophets. That's a key, that's a key teaching in the book of Isaiah that we're learning. So um, the cast of characters in the tribulation, I took off nations at your suggestion and just put earth dwellers. So on the good side in the tribulation, you have the Trinity, you have angels, elect angels uh, who are very active in that time period, doing a lot of jobs and sent on lots of errands for, for God. You have the 144,000 Jews, which we talked about last week. They, they are sealed um, and they're not allowed to be touched until um, God allows that maybe at the mid-trib mid point but they are evangelists. And then the great multitude is the Gentiles who come to faith in Jesus during the tribulation, many of whom are martyred. And the two witnesses, well, so now we're going to talk about the two witnesses and the remnant of Israel. 
Then we'll switch over to the bad side and, and talk about Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, and earth dwellers. We'll see how far we get. So the two witnesses. So these are, um, well, we'll just read it and then just point out a few details that we learned from the text. So this is uh, a Revelation 11, three to six. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. So if you're going off 30 day months, that would be exactly three and a half years. So again and again, you see that, that period, three and a half. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them, conquer them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. So there you, if there's any doubt what the city is, you've got it right there. For three and a half days, some from the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will gaze at their dead bodies, probably on a TV screen or their computer screen, and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth, okay, continuing on, but after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. One observation is that there's a lot of de detail. Details that should be taken seriously. If, if you're trying to allegorize this, you're just going to have a tough time. I don't know how you would explain the detail if this is just an allegory. Another observation is that nothing like this has ever remotely happened, which suggests that this event, as well as other events, are in the future. They have a job to do. Their job is to prophesy, to warn, uh, and to, yeah, to, yeah, they're, basically, they're, they're there to preach the word of God, and they have a power from God to be able to do various things if they're if they have any opponents that try to do them harm so who are these two witnesses speculation we don't know we don't know we will find out we will one day know <laughs> yeah we can guess um yeah i mean is it enoch is it elijah because they are the two individuals who never experienced physical death in the old testament so moses moses and elijah that would match the transfiguration yeah yeah that's right that's right yeah yeah so we again we won't be around we will we will be in heaven at that point um but the people on earth should take note don't bother these guys and so 
yeah, the, the, the beast, who is the Antichrist, uh, that, that rises from the bottomless pit, we'll talk about that later, will make war on them and conquer them. So one of the ways that the, the Antichrist will, will gain power over the world is that he gets rid of these two guys. Um, and that's, he'll, he'll, you know, he'll be praised and, and even later worshipped for his power to be able to do what no one else could do. And, um, but for three and a half days, they're dead. But all of a sudden, when those three and a half days, and notice the parties, the parties, and ex, they're even exchanging presents because of these two prophets and what they had, what they had done on the earth. But they come to life, and it's much like, it almost sounds like Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Um, they come to life, the breath enters them, um, there's great fear, and they come up to heaven in a cloud, verse 12. Um, yeah, and their enemies watch this happen, and there's a great earthquake. So this is the two witnesses. They have an important part to play in the tribulation on the side of good, on, the, on God's team. Yeah, three and a half days. Who else was dead for three days and three nights? Somebody was just maybe. Yes, that's right. Oh, it's just maybe just having a sleep. Three and a half days. Three and a half days. But they want them dead. I mean, I never thought about it till today. You know, the plagues and the they were making people's lives miserable. Yeah. Yeah, like. Yeah, they're they're a thorn in the side of yeah. the otherwise. A lot of people think that the first three and a half years are going to be relatively peaceful. Um, some people think that the the uh, seals, trumpets, and bulls all come in the last three and a half years. So in other words, the first three and a half are really quite nice and peaceful, lots of security, and everything happens in the last three and a half years. I think possibly that's a possibility. Some good commentators, I think um, Dwight Pentecost might have that. You, you, yeah, he's a famous Dallas seminary professor. So. one percent of people in five years. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Okay. So that's the two witnesses. Let's talk about Israel. What's going to happen to Israel? Um, particularly, we've talked about the 144,000, but that there's more Jews on the earth than just the 144,000 during that time. So let's, here's what Jesus says about the remnant of Israel or how really he instructs the remnant of Israel in the tribulation. And this is at the midpoint when the Antichrist turns. Um, so Matthew 24, 15 to 20. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, and that's a reference to Daniel 9, 27, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women, is that an earthquake? I, I keep thinking I feel something. And, and alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Shabbat. Okay, so Jesus um, is here talking about the midpoint of the tribulation, and he's instructing the disciples. Now, the disciples will be dead by that time, but he's really instructing Israel during the tribulation through the disciples, and they're recording it in the book of Matthew. It's actually in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this same instruction. So it's meant to get to Israel living in the days of the tribulation. And so when they see the Antichrist putting up this abomination in the temple, that's, that's the time when they need to stop what they're doing and flee to the wilderness, flee to the mountains here. And it's so urgent that they flee that, you know, they, 
they shouldn't even go get their cloak and they should pray that it's not in winter or a Shabbat. The fact that it's on a Shabbat focuses us not on the nations in general, but on Israel in particular. So it's mainly focused on those who are in Judea, verse 16. So that's how you know it's Israel that's in view here. This matches what we read in Revelation 12, 12, 6, where we read, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. <clears throat> in context, the woman is Israel. This is the woman that uh, gave birth to a child that was snatched up. And remember, that's probably a reference to the church being raptured. And so the woman continues on, the church or the, the child is taken up, but the woman continues to exist on earth. And it's at this time that she flees into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for three and a half years. So again, this matches the, the amount of days and months that we've been talking about. So in the second half of the tribulation, Israel will be hiding in basically Jordan in a place called Petra or Basra. And God will supernaturally provide and protect them during that period. And Satan and the Antichrist will not be allowed to destroy them. Have you heard that before? Yeah, so, it's interesting that um, God is the protector because we know where they're going. So yeah. it's not like they're hiding. Right. It's been written here for generations where they're going to, and yet they will be protected. Right. So, yeah. yeah, Satan knows where they're going to go. <laughs> we know where they're going to go. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so here's more from Revelation 12. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, but the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness. Maybe that's uh, the U.S. Air Force. I don't know. No. Um, into the wilderness to the place, C-17 or something, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and a times and a half a time. So that's another way of saying three and a half years. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman. Interesting. I don't know whether that's literal or metaphorical, but in some way the serpent will try to flood Israel and sweep her away. Verse 16. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. I take that to be not just Jews scattered throughout the world, but believers, anyone who has chosen Jesus over the Antichrist throughout the world. So, that, that, so this all happens at the midpoint of the tribulation, this flood and the earth coming to the rescue of Israel, and then satan will be furious and 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 go off and make war through the antichrist on all believers on earth during the last three and a half years any questions about the two witnesses or the remnant of israel okay good how are we doing on time yeah doing very good okay now let's go to the bad side what's what is the the forces of evil the characters representing evil going to be doing during this seven-year period. So in Revelation 12, 7 and 9, we hear more about Satan in verse 7. Now, war arose in heaven. Now, this is talking again about the midpoint of the tribulation. War arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he referring to Satan, was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, 
and his angels were thrown down with him. So there's an angelic uh, battle, Michael and his, his angels versus Satan and his angels, otherwise known as the demons. And notice God is not involved. Jesus is not involved here. It's simply an angelic fight. And the, uh, the, the good angels win, and Satan is kicked out or thrown down. Um, verse 9, he's thrown down out of heaven. And there's a list of his names and descriptions. And not just Satan, but his angels are thrown down as well. Other verses tell us that one-third of the angels are fallen and two-thirds are elect or good. So you've got two-thirds of the angels versus one-third of the angels. And this is interesting because um, this tells us that right now Satan does have access to heaven. Um, yeah, yeah, you see that in Job as well. So Satan, Satan has access, the way, the way I see it, he has access to both heaven and earth. He can walk around on earth. He can come to heaven and, um, and yeah, speak to God when God allows, um, as, he, as we see in the early chapters of Job. But at this point, in the midpoint of the tribulation, it's a significant moment in Satan's history because he will never be allowed again to enter history. So, yeah, so the end, his end is coming. And soon he'll be chained at the end of the tribulation. So he's thrown down, and then, verse 12, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman, we've already seen that with the remnant of Israel, who had, been, who had, who had given birth to the male child. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. All right, so Satan's thrown down. He tries to destroy Israel. That fails. So then he makes war on the rest of the believers on earth, and he's standing on the sand of the sea. That's how that chapter ends. And the next chapter is the two beasts that arise. Um, I thought the church was a woman, was portrayed as a woman, and here it's a man. A child. Yeah, it's, it's a metaphor. Yeah. So different metaphors can be used by different biblical authors at different times without conflict. Yeah, and, and a lot of people say this is Jesus and Jesus was male and Israel did give birth to Jesus. Jesus was Jewish. Um, but, uh, you know, we've talked about this in, in previous weeks, but that earlier in chapter 12, it, it really looks like it's Jesus and the church are the, are the child, you know, because both Jesus and the church are said to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So, and that's what you see earlier in chapter 12. Okay, so that is Satan. Now, there's more that could be said, but let's turn to the Antichrist. So, the first time we see the Antichrist in the book of Revelation is in chapter 6, during the seals. And the first seal is, uh, is uh, described in Revelation 6, 1 and 2, and verse 2 says, and I looked and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow, a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. So there's a bit of ambiguity here, but most expositors believe that this is because later Jesus comes on a white horse, but this is at the beginning of the tribulation, not at the end. So if there's a guy riding a white horse at the beginning of the tribulation, look out. You don't want to follow that guy. But if there's a guy on a white horse at the end of the tribulation, that's the right one. So it's almost like a counterfeit. So here, here's the counterfeit savior. And um, some, some 
some commentators notice that he has a bow, but not an arrow, which may signify he comes in sort of a false piece. Um, I don't know how much to look, how much we could, we could. Yeah, yeah, but he comes out conquering and to conquer. So there seems to be some, obviously he's, he is a conqueror. So, but basically the reason I put this verses up, up here is he, he will, he will be, um, he will be a king. He will have a crown and he will deceive, you know, he will be a counterfeit to the real Messiah. Okay. In Revelation 13, we get a lot of information about the Antichrist and the false prophets. So let's look at this carefully in Revelation 13, 1 to 6. Is there some water? Um, oh, there it is. Yeah. Thanks, Yolanda. Thank you. Just get a quick drink here. Okay, Revelation 13, 1 to 6. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power, his throne, and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, again, three and a half years. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. All right, so this, it now the word Antichrist isn't found in Revelation. It is found in other, other um, books of the Bible. So, but it, it I mean, it, it seems like it's the same, it's the same person. Um, he rises out of the sea. And he also has a mortal wound, verse 3. This seems to indicate that sometime between the beginning of the tribulation and the midpoint that he is killed. And this is Arnold Fruchtenbaum's position. Um, and that he come, basically he comes, Satan brings him back to life. What's interesting about that is because the real messiah died and came back to life and so there seems to be a symmetry between what the trinity is doing and what the false trinity is doing and when i say false trinity i'm meaning satan the counterfeit or the opponent of god the father the antichrist the opponent to jesus and the false prophet the opponent to the holy spirit so I, I, I mean, yeah, and we see there's more from in Revelation 17 about that indicates that the Antichrist was, is not, and will be, which seems to indicate that he was alive, he died, and then he came back to life. So not a whole lot of other detail besides those, those two passages. Um, notice that Satan gives him, pa his, his power comes from Satan. It reminds you of Judas um, on the night when Jesus was betrayed. In fact, I hesitate to mention this, but some people think Judas is the Antichrist and that Satan brings Judas back to life. Um, then you get into the debate of, is the Antichrist going to be Gentile or Jewish? And, you know, most people think he's going to be Gentile because he's associated with the Roman Empire. But there's a handful of people that think he could be Jewish. So we, we, we won't go into the, yeah, we won't go into that debate because we're just kind of, this is an overview. But these are... great mass of people. This one guy comes up, he's not a submarine. 
Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. This is figurative. He doesn't really have uh, feet like a bear's, you know, that that's figurative. So you have, you do have to be able to read revelation. They stand for something literal, but they're a physical kind of metaphor for something literal. Does that make sense? Um, he has a mortal wound. Um, the earth dwellers worship the dragon, Satan, because he gave his authority to the beast. That's similar to, you know, we worship the father because he has given authority to the son. You know, there's a lot of uh, parallels here. Um, he has, he speaks blasphemous words. He exercises authority for three and a half years. Um, he, yeah, and he blasphemes those in heaven. Yeah, and they worshiped the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast. So it, it appears evil and wickedness and deception and even outright Satan worship will be so prevalent by the earth dwellers that, yeah. So, and, and unless Satan is disguising himself in some way, which he did in the Garden of Eden. So maybe maybe they'll view Satan as the real God in some way. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So maybe he will just deceive people into worshiping him. Yeah. Okay. Verses seven to ten, same chapter. Or sorry, yeah, seven to ten. Also, it was allowed it, uh, the Antichrist, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe, people, language, and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Pay attention. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So he is a world ruler he has world authority and he's given authority to make war on all the saints yeah yeah it was yeah it's a it, interesting way it's in the it's a, it's a passive voice it was allowed to make war on the saints good point God's still in, in control. Okay, so that's the Antichrist. And let's finish up with the false prophet. So the false prophet is the third member of the unholy trinity. And verse 11, we read, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. Okay, so out of the sea and out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Okay, there you go. Mortal. So the first beast had a mortal wound that was healed. And this false prophet, again, it doesn't say false prophet. It's just a beast. But I think it's called a false prophet later in Revelation in 19 when they're thrown into the uh lake of fire so um yeah so like the spirit you know focuses people on to the real christ the false prophet will focus people on the false christ so again we see that that uh parallel um, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. So similar to those two witnesses, 
and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So again, we see the Antichrist was wounded by the sword. He has a mortal wound. So it does appear that the Antichrist will be killed and then rise again. So notice now we have an image. We not only have the three members of the unholy trinity, but an image. And this image is created or made by the earth dwellers at the encouragement of the false prophet. Verse 15, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So the false prophet is allowed, notice the passive voice again, God allows this, to give breath to this image of the beast that's been created by the earth dwellers, and that will enable this image to speak, come alive you know, almost like artificial intelligence or some kind of new technology. And um, it orders, you know, those who won't worship the image to be slain. And then you have this mark that will enable people to buy and sell. And without it, you won't, you won't be able to do that. And the, num and the number is 666, as you have, have heard. So this is all at the at the uh, the activity of the false prophet okay we'll stop there um, with uh, earth dwellers again we've got the good and evil characters of the tribulation we've discussed the two witnesses the remnant of israel satan antichrist and false prophet and we haven't got to earth dwellers yet um, I think we should begin to move away from this topic and move on to some other topics. So let's make this the last, la our last discussion of the tribulation period. And next week, let's talk about the thousand year. Well, no, let's talk about the return of Jesus. Yeah, which is next. So let's focus next week on the second coming. And then we'll, the following will be on the thousand year millennial kingdom. Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for this, this study of the tribulation over five weeks. And thank you that, yeah, we see that you're in control, that your justice is done, that, uh, yeah, the people on the earth have a choice to make. And thank you that at the end of it all, Jesus returns and that the kingdom we've been waiting for will begin. So thank you for these truths and uh, may they change the way we live and cause us to worship you and to live, live lives of holiness. In Christ's name, amen. This is a Frenchman who at the moment is trying to work on a figure to make it move and talk.